name is Colby Miller. I'm one of the marketing managers for Data Robot. We are one of the platinum sponsors here at Collide this year. We've been very pleased to be here. It's been a lot of fun talking to a lot of you over the past couple of days about where everyone is on this crazy AI journey, and we're going to dive a little bit more into that in our panel session today, the title of which is From Mirage to Mastery, Navigating the AI Landscape Beyond Empty Promises. So we're really going to take this in sort of three phases. We're going to talk with our panel here, who I'll introduce in a moment, about the challenges of increasing that AI maturity, getting on the road to getting real business results and outcomes out of AI, some of the challenges that some of the folks have, uh, have experienced along the way in their journey. We're gonna talk about what they're doing today, the, how they are you leveraging AI for business results within the institutions, within the organizations that they, they work for and work with. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the art of the possible, and this is where we're gonna touch on that wonderful topic that I'm sure everybody has heard ad nauseum throughout the, the conference here, generative AI, and what that means in real terms for business value moving forward. Um, so we appreciate you all being here with you today. I am joined by a wonderful panel of folks directly to my left here who has been a star of this stage throughout the, uh, the two days already, Ms. Selma Dodgic with Carters. And if you don't know who Carters are, they are the num national number one brand retailer for children's clothing and own it Oshkosh Pagosh as well. Is that correct? Yes. I do want to say that you're doing a great job and yeah. have made me question my moderating skills because this <laughs> intro, I'm living for it. All right. Good, good. Well, I appreciate your, your endorsement <laughs> for sure. To uh, my far, uh, next in line here is Mr. Jason Harper. He is the managing director for RxA at One Magnify, who is one of our strategic partners with Data Robot and is really helping to guide customers on that AI journey and really helping them to implement um, the solutions that are getting real results. And we'll talk about some of that in specificity. To his left is Ms. Sarah Gibson, who is a analytics manager with Affleck who, if you don't been living under a rock for uh, basically the past 20 years, uh, the number one health care, or sorry, health insurance supplemental provider in the United States. And then finally on the end there we have Ms. Jessica Lynn, who is a senior data scientist with Data Robot. And so we will be giving perspective of kind of some end users and end customers of, of AI and that are, are leveraging. And then of course with Jason and Jessica kind of chiming in on what they're seeing broadly across the customer set that they we're engaging with. So. I'm gonna start off some, if you don't mind, coming to you first. So maybe give us just a little bit of an overview of how you at Carter's are leveraging AI right now, and you know, kind of briefly, but then talk about like, what were some of the challenges of getting there as you've seen that occur? Yeah, so we've been on a, I'd say data and analytics transformation journey for the last four years. When I came into Carter's, we were really focused on kind of descriptive analytics, right? So telling the business what happened. Um, we had a really central data and analytics team that was building out all of the, the dashboards and data products. Um, and when I came in, we wanted to look forward to uh, more predictive analytics, right? Diagnostic analytics of so telling the business what happened, how can you make something happen, um, and scaling that throughout. So there was a big focus on self-service analytics. When I look at now, right, our current landscape and how we're leveraging AI, um, we have data, the data robot platform that we're leveraging more as a, a citizen data scientist platform. So we're enabling business users to build and scale their own ML models. Um, and really we're like at the infancy of that journey, right? So we're building out a roadmap for each business function to say this is kind of, the next best thing that you can do in your uh, AI journey. And then to your point with AI, generative AI, I think that there's, right, like we're obviously on this hype cycle and so everybody's really excited to figure out how we can leverage it. We do have an AI task force that's doing some exploration on what are those use cases for generative AI and how do we implement them in house. Fair enough. I think it's really good insight. Sarah, I want to come to you next, kind of similar question, right? From a Aflac standpoint and the work that you're doing within Aflac, how kind of, are you leveraging AI as a technology today? And then what, what have been a few of those bumps in the road that maybe have occurred as you've seen that progress within your organization? Right, so as you know, Aflac is a very old -er company. So trying to get buy-in from the business is one of our hardest challenges. Like, I feel like it should be this way. And why is your 
model telling me something else. So us having to say, well, you want to add a feelings button because it'll make it all better, um, <laughs> has always been our joke, but really showing how the model works, how your their actual features that you know we pick out um, are influencing our volumes and our projections has really been the best way for them to get a buy-in. Gotcha. Now, that makes a lot of sense. In fact, I know some of us sitting in on your panel that you hosted yesterday, that explainability issue was, was top of mind for pretty much everybody. And it's one thing to have the functionality of, you know, the, of, of AI within a platform and your data all put together. But at the end of the day, if uh, the, the big wigs in the C-suite aren't buying into it and aren't investing into it, it's not really going to go anywhere. I, and I want to add to that, too. I think because of so much of the hype around generative AI, there's a lot of this push to like move fast, do something, right? And you kind of end up, if you, if you appease, right, putting the cart before the horse. And I think that's like one of the biggest challenges in implementing AI or ML across organizations is really getting stakeholder buy-in, but buy-in in the right way, right? Like, not just like, oh yeah, I care about it because it's, it seems important in the broader landscape, but I care about it because I know that it's gonna have a business impact and it's gonna help me like grow my business, right? right? And that's that by far has been the most difficult. Very good. Jason, coming to you, I'm guessing that this resonates with you is probably a tale that you see with the RXA1 Magnify as you are working with customers and almost being that uh, counselor and consultant along the way of how to position that to their, their stakeholders and decision makers, right? Well, I think, yeah, the, the, what we're seeing is there's just such a wide spread now when we talk to organizations, like where, where people are at. And some folks are in the, oh, my God, I need a task force, and I need all this, like, because I, 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 you know, like, at the, the leaders are hearing this from their peers, and they don't want to get left behind, and they're, there's, like, this kind of fear of missing out mentality, too, and it's like a race, right? And it's sort of like the, the constant reminder that we have is, like, well, let's just take a step back, what do you want to get out of this? Like, we don't need an AI. Like, no, like, let's, what are, like, what are we trying to do? And then can, can these things solve it, right? And so helping folks sort of deal with the hype cycle machine and that, and then really get back to basics of like, okay, like, let's have a roadmap and a plan and we can execute this, right? So it's sort of like yeah. having those conversations. And there's a variety of people at different ends. There's a variety of sort of like, folks sit across like that wide spectrum too, right? There are also some people who are at the other end where they're like, we're not ready. Like, and it's like, what do you mean you're not ready? You don't have a right. choice in this matter. Right. Like, I'm not saying like go race and dive off the cliff without looking, but I'm saying you need to start making progress now. Like I was on, I was on a plane here with this, I just had to sit next to the CTO of a media company. So of course we got to talking and of course I was shamelessly trying to sell him all sorts of stuff because <laughs> he's stuck in a captive audience. And, you know, the conversation, though, it was clear, like, he's like, he doesn't want anything to do with AI, machine learning, and all that. Like, that's a later thing for him. He's like, we're not ready. We got to do all this stuff. I got to, and he's, he's telling me all this stuff. And it's like, there's a balance there. So it's helping folks sort of, like, get into that spectrum of making intentional, productive progress. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Actually, I uh, was part of a panel on Monday <laughs> at another event in Nashville, and that was a big talking point of the, if you are waiting until your data is all nice and tidy and buttoned up with a bow to start down an AI journey, like you're never going to get there. It's never going to happen. So you need to be thinking about these things and, you know, simultaneously, it's not a consecutive, like, order of operation. So just to you, I mean, from a data robot standpoint, right? I mean, obviously the platform has been around at this point, nine, 10 years. You've been with the company, I believe six or so, six and a half, is that right? And so, I'm sure this is a common tale of that whole AI maturity curve, right? And how we are, are communicating to customers about that. How, how have you seen that evolve in your time with, with DataRobot? Yeah, evolving over time has been an interesting point where yes, to your point, um, it can be very hard to get past that initial, I feel like this is always true. It's someone who's been successful in their field, who's someone who is, does have a really deep understanding but then we have to go through that process of let's scale this, let's accelerate this, let's further personalize this and making sure that their experience with that is still, you know, it's still lived in, it's still, it's still true, but how can we improve upon this? Another flavor to that though is also working with a data scientist, which I do quite a lot, is 
trying to help them understand that, yes, there is a data scientist way to do it. There's a, there's a certain way that you can say is the perfect path. However, we do still need to take the business stakeholder into account. So these feelings, their lived in experience also need to be incorporated into whatever you're building. It may not be perfect. It may not be the exact way that you wanted to approach it, but it still needs to be incorporated. Yeah. No, fair enough. I think it's a, so I do like to pull the audience with these things a little bit of kind of on this concept of an AI maturity curve. I want, I'm, if you wouldn't do me the favor of just you'll hold up a hand and hold up a digit of one, two, or three. One being we aren't anywhere, we haven't started or we're just barely starting. Our data's still a mess. We're trying to get a lot of things in order. We, we can't even go down that road yet. Number two being all right, we've got some things in place. Maybe we've even built a, a model or two. Maybe there's one in production, but we're still kind of dipping our toe in the water. And three being, we're getting value out of AI on a daily basis, multiple models in production, and, and we're really headed down that road. Let me just see kind of by show of hands and, and a digit of where, where folks are on that, that path. Yeah. So I would say this is, and I also give the caveat, if your boss is sitting next to you, just like do it low, right? Don't. Uh, <laughs> You can do it quite subtly, but I, 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 looking out at it, it, it you're, you're a fairly typical audience, right? Of like, usually 70 to 80% of the audience is in that one or two uh, spectrum, right? Yeah, I, I saw a couple threes, maybe one gentleman up here and, uh, and maybe one over here, but that is a fairly standard uh, uh, um, kind of spread of, of that particular question, which is why these conversations I think are important because first off, it's nice to hear specifically from those folks that are leveraging within the organization, also hearing that it's not perfect. It's not like it, you know, we, even once you get there, it's still a constant work in progress, constant have to be showing that ROI. And then, you know, it, it, it's so I think it's good from a, a relating standpoint and then talking about how from a vendor standpoint, we're looking to solve some of these issues and make that, you know, path easier for you. Um, so I'm gonna come to you kind of on that point of like, what you're doing today, and without giving away the, the secret sauce of, of how you know, Data Robot as a platform, but you know, you, what are some of the use cases you guys are leveraging within, within your org? Yeah, so it's actually really funny. When I was preparing for this, I was thinking about, right, like our, our journey over the past two years. Um, and I remember some of the first use cases that we took under our belt in the COE always came top down, right? So it was the CIO wanted to know this, we built a model. The CMO wanted to know this, we built a model, right? So it was uh, predictions around e-commerce traffic because um, our channels, right, we, we have brick and mortar direct to consumer and then we have our e-commerce channel um, that kind of operates a little bit differently. And during COVID, we saw a big spike. So what was happening to e-com after, after COVID? So we did a predictive model there. Um, we built a model uh, that would also predict or the estimate the impact of marketing on demand, right? So like a big demand model that incorporated a bunch of different features. But what we really found was because those were coming top down, right? They had these big ideas, it was top of mind. We worked really hard to spin up a model really fast. Um, we, there was no due diligence before that to really like, it seems like they're bought in, right? But like, what's the feasibility of this model once we put it into production, it making an impact on the business, right? Like it actually, changing decisions and people implementing those decisions based on the insights of the model. And because that hadn't happened, those models kind of ended up being shelfware, right? So they, they, they were in production, but they weren't being leveraged. Where we found the most success, and I would say that this is across the board, not just in, in the AI ML space, but also when we think about like business intelligence, decision insights, right? Is like looking at the low hanging fruit first, because when I, when I commit to a project with a business sponsor, what I think about and talk about with them is, what's the ROI, right? So what's the ben business benefit? Let's, can we quantify that? But also what's the feasibility, right? And when I think about fe feasibility, I don't just think about like, can we do the development? Is the development feasible? But I think about like, once we, build the model. Is it feasible that you have control over the decisions, right, to, to implement changes within your uh, business processes to actually realize that ROI? And if the feasibility is med medium and low, I'm likely not to going to take that project on, right? I'd rather take on a project that has medium ROI and high feasibility. It's low-hanging fruit. I know I can do it, and I know I can 
like prove it to be successful, right? Like that I could actually implement the business to change. Once you do that and you have that under your belt, it's so much easier to like expand into uh, more complex use cases. Oh, that's fantastic. It's funny as we're having this conversation, realizing that we've talked very little about, you know, coding, right? Or the actual like nuts and bolts, the data science part of the machine learning and deploying of AI it has a lot to do with culture with yeah. people right yeah and i would say too like this is something i didn't want to interject when you guys were talking about it but like it's almost never a data problem right. like in the world that we live in now there's data for everything and even it, when it's really really shitty data we have processes in place right to like clean it up we can augment that data we can make it clean really quickly right like with all of this new technology that we have so it's not a data problem ever it's more of a people problem yeah. right a people processes problem interesting sarah to you on that i mean you talked about already like which is kind of the the legacy mindset of, of the organization you work with but You've gotten over this hump a little bit, I think, now, right? So what, what, are, what are some of the ways that you have finally kind of got some of that buy-in and seeing, you know, AI models, you know, have some results for you and use cases that you're deploying within Affleck? Right. So one of our first, I would say, models inside DataRobot we did was, you know, how when you go to Amazon, it says people like you have bought this. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we personalize it for Affleck? And so we've taken our customer information and, you know, we've kind of, weeded out some data. We want to keep customers longer, so how do we make sure that happens? And then our agents are able to go into a sit-down conversation meeting with new potential customers and say, hey, you know, plug in just a few information about us, and then we'll be able to say, hey, people like you bought accident or cancer because you want hospital or because, and be able to personalize it more. Mm -hmm. And that's actually in production across, and we're actually really able to see ROs ROIs, which is a big reason that this was so successful. And I mean, I was just in a meeting last week about how do we expand this? How do we not just make it, you know, new customers? How do we make it existing customers? Right. And that takes it, you know, to a whole new level. Um, that's one big use case. Kind of the thing we're working on right now is um, dormancy and keeping customers longer. Mm. How do we identify a customer that could potentially be based on other customers who have left? And how do we implement something based on our model? Right. Like we see that they haven't filed a claim or they've called the call center 30 times. How do we mitigate that before they leave and try to get them back in the green um, as we call it? Right. No, fantastic. And I think like I, I, the, the concept of of the low hanging fruit and something like a propensity to buy model, I think is obviously one that if you're, you're showing some bottom line impact, that's usually going to get some approvals uh, up and down and maybe open up some other doors for go down other paths. You know, Jason, I know that that, you know, propensity to buy, you know, uh, use case within the healthcare space, I know it resonates with you and RXA with some of the work that you've been doing in the automotive space. Maybe speak to that from, from how, how you've gone down that road with, with, with customers and, and are showing that value from, from the models they deploy. Yeah, I mean, I think Jack probably spoke about this today. Mm -hmm. Jack's one of the, if you guys have a chance to talk to Jack, to talk to Jack, he's mm -hmm. in our booth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for us, like, it's been, and for myself, especially doing this now for around 20 years, well, he has 23 years, uh, and seeing the, the realization, right? So, in particular, when it comes to, like, those, like, those types of predictive analytics and those types of, those types of use cases that the level of granularity of the data that we have today and the power to be able to actually use tools like Data Robot, uh, huge fan of Data Robot, by the way. Uh, and I think, you know, seeing how, especially in automotive, where you have a, like a, it's a very considered purchase, right? Insurance, very considered. Automotive, very considered. It's, for most folks, it's like that second most expensive thing you're gonna purchase next to your house. And for a lot of people, it is the most expensive thing you're gonna purchase. And so being able to really get into granular lifestyle type data points, behavioral data points, um, and that combination of watching you sort of through this life cycle and being able to have really tailored, personalized communications being sent based on where you're at in this propensity and looking for those little indications of being able to say, oh, this has occurred, now you're likely, or now some, and being able to do that productionalized at scale, it's honestly really just, it's incredible that that is the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Like that is incredibly powerful, incredibly valuable, and 
that is literally low hanging fruit now. So it's like super exciting to see that because you know when I got started that we were trying to do this stuff in Excel, which right. was a little bit difficult. Right. Just from your standpoint of positioning data robot for, for customers, how do you go about helping them identify what that low hanging fruit is, right? Well, what, like, what are those quick wins that we can get to get buy-in? How, how do you go about that conversation? Yeah, a lot of brainstorming. We use you know, the past of everything that we've worked on across the past decade at Data Robot to try to start kickstart some ideas. One way that I think is interesting to, to start a conversation, this leads to the feasibility, is asking, let's say we have the perfect solution. What does the implementation look like? How can we actually make sure this ends up impacting decisions, whether it be you know, an email that gets sent out or it's a score on someone's, you know, in, in a dashboard or wherever it lives, it cannot die in a PowerPoint presentation somewhere. We have to imagine, let's quickly pretend that you know, the data science part is easy. We all know it's not, but pretend that we have the perfect solution now. What do you do with it? And sometimes that helps leads to more conversations of maybe the people that we're talking to need to loop in more stakeholders. Maybe we need to ensure that, you know, the IT team is involved or whatever it is. This can help us get to what are the easiest things for us to do that will still derive value where we can get to that end result as quickly as possible. Right. No, that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that it... The, obviously the looping in the stakeholders, getting it widely across. I, I want to kind of switch a little bit on that note to kind of explainability and governance, right, of the AI in deployments. Okay, again, you're here. How do you continue to maintain the trust of the model and, and maintain the trust of your stakeholders in the model and what you're doing? And, and I guess it, it approach to that sort of explainability, you know, piece of, of this puzzle. Is that for me? Yeah, it's for you. I'm looking <laughs> at you, sorry. At Selma, like, yes, you take that. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think, right, like, whenever we engaged on a machine learning project, I mean, the, the bulk of it is really, it's because we have data robot and we're so thankful for it, we can actually do the development really quickly, but it's the iteration of it that takes time, right? It's like the testing against the, the subject matter expertise. Is this really, like, does this insight make sense? Like, is this what we're seeing? Um, against the ground truth, is this what we're seeing um, like correlate to like, you know, true business outcomes? Um, so doing a lot of that testing, once we put a model in deployment, I will say that um, a little plug and I don't want to be shameless about it, but um, with Data Robot, because they have the ML ops piece of it, we can really monitor the performance of our models to make sure that Again, they're like they're maintaining their accuracy, but also uh, when we see the data drifting, so the insights are kind of like drifting outside of the norm. We can then go and address that, and, and that's been really insightful for us. But it's always like that that communication with the business leaders and with the business implementers has been really key. Again, it's it's really the people processes and staying in line with them is what what helps us kind of expand. Right, um, machine learning at Carter's, and um, and the explainability of it too. Again, it's just making sure that we're we're validating against the real world. Right. Sarah, from for you, is it from an explainability standpoint and that governance? You know, how are you guys approaching like your governance of the models? That that is a similar approach to what you're hearing from. Yeah, from very similar yeah. to what she said. Um, <clears throat> but I also think, as everyone has said, kind of bringing in stakeholders, it's helped us not be so siloed. And that was a big part, like, issue that we had, you know, five plus years ago is that we were all, we did our own thing and then the business did their own thing and we kind of might have conflicting numbers that might not help. But, like, now that we're able to, you know, I think COVID helped in a way a lot and made us reach out to people more. It um, has definitely closed the gap. So... If they're kind of like, mm, I'm not really sure, but you know, the model says it's great, we might go back and recheck, might try to do some different things because they know the business so well. Right. Can I just, so yeah. adding to that, I think that, that breaking down of silos, and I think the number one thing that I've seen over my career, the number one most important thing when it comes to giving credibility is that the business owner, business manager, believes and understands that you, as a data scientist, understand the business. So it's not just about numbers and accuracy and things, but you actually understand that there's a consumer walking into a store, 
making a selection, having a problem, like that you really understand that. And if you can convey that to the business owner, that's going to drive a lot of credibility and they're going to ask less questions about credibility, less like, is it da 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 da? Because they're, they're going to feel like, no, they have this. They under, they're part of like the business. They're not this team over here to the side. I feel like we maybe should have titled this session the, the human side of AI. Like, I think that we keep going back to that concept, right? Of that it's, you know, the data science part, as you've mentioned, Jess, is not the easy part, but at the same time, it is about people issues and understanding the business. And so I, I guess, you know, and talk a little bit, Jess, from a product standpoint, because I, while you aren't shameless about the plug for data robot, I will be. Um, but, you know, obviously, explainability, monitoring of the models, and, and we can even kind of use this to transition to that generative AI talk because metrics and, and, and monitoring of gen AI uh, applications, absolutely crucial. Talk about how that approach from a product standpoint for data, data robot and why that's so important. Sure, sure. I think we've talked a lot about governance here. I think something also important to keep in mind, earlier today I heard another talk where they mentioned you know, human in the loop. So never forget that there is a human element involved, whether you're interacting with a person, someone's building it, you're creating this decision based off of someone's experience, there is still a human and you need to take that feedback into, like as you're using the model, either have a human in the loop to be part of this decisioning process, or as time goes on, you know, either build in guard. So as we're watching the drifts, so, you know, as we're looking at drift over time, assessing how should we be changing the results of how we're using this model based on how people are actually using it. How you imagine there is a difference between what you expect going in, you build a model, you have expectations, you want a person there to, to be involved in the process, that's a late notification <laughs> over there. And people are gonna, the way that it's used in practice will continue shifting and evolving over time. This is incredibly true for generative AI. For uh, predictive AI use cases, typically when you're, your engagement, something shifts within the demographics that you're working with. That's typically where you see uh, the drift happening, but on the generative side, this is, you have this idea, maybe you, you have a chat bot that's asking questions. Are people shifting the way that they interact with this bot over time? Are you, you know, are you, what kinds of information are you producing? How can you make sure that it continues to line up with user expectations over time. So the two sides are like within Data Robot, there needs to be humility in your models involved because data science, as much as I love data science, I think this is an incredible field. It's never the end all be all. You need to have some humility in how the predictions are produced and how they're integrated into that end result. You need to monitor what's happening over time and continue improving and reframing what you've put out in the wild and you need to make sure that you're staying on top of how your end user is interacting with it. Right. Yeah. Did you have a follow up on that? <laughs> I can see I the wheels yeah, turning. Yeah, I can't help myself. I'm sorry. I, just, <laughs> and I think just, just what you're saying too, like when I hear that, I mean, I, I, I always believe that the dirty little secret of data science is that it's more of an art than a science. And so incorporating that human in the loop, the thinking of like, it's never perfect, you just run out of time is sort of like the same cause. It's just, it's something that's like evolving and the right. human brain and you're here watching and understanding and thinking is like critical regardless of what the machine is telling you. Fair, no, I, absolutely. Again, the human, human side of AI is what we should call this session. Um, so, all right, we, we, if we switch to kind of talking more, kind of looking forward right now, and, and obviously generative AI being a big part of that, but we can't have that conversation without talking about the ethical element of it, right? Um, obviously, there's been multiple panels that have occurred here this week talking about the ethics of AI and of generative AI. You can't open up your phone or a news app without seeing uh, that. I know for a lot of my family, when I told them I work for an AI company, they were for sure it was Skynet from Terminator. Uh, you know, there's this perception out there, and, and, and rightly so, right, of the considerations of the, of the ethical element. And even as, Jason, you were talking about, like, the use case of, of kind of your customer life cycle, right, and the granularity of the data that is being considered there, like, that, that has to come into play. We have to have that consideration. So I guess I'll, I'll start, Selma, with you from a Carter standpoint. What are some of those ethical considerations that are or questions that are coming up either from your 
customers or within inside the organization about how to sort of ethically apply this technology? Yeah, I mean, for us, the 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 foremost kind of concern is actually around privacy, right? And so that has a little bit to do with the ethics of it. We want to make sure that we are being responsible with the, the people data that we have and own, and particularly around our customers, right? And so there's a big concern around that, and um, that's been the biggest consideration. But another thing that I've, you know, even yesterday we talked about this, is that these models have real implications, right? Like real world implications, I mean, I remember we were talking uh, with the global head of Ronstadt, um, data science for Ronstadt, and he was saying that like they use this to determine who goes to the next round on an interview, right? They did, they use this to determine who to interview in the first place, and those can be like life changing, right? Decisions that you're letting a model make, and so same for us. Like when we look at um, you know partnering with people analytics, these are life changing you know, results sometimes or decisions. Um, same thing around our customers, right? Now, that might not be life-changing, but there are implications there. We want to make sure that we're being fair, that we're being inclusive, um, and that we value our, our um, core, core values, right, of, of um, inclusivity and diversity. So there are really kind of big implications around that, and I would say for us, you know, especially around generative AI, it has always been around the security and the privacy risks, but of course, the ethical implications of it as well. Sarah, I'm guessing again from your opening statement of kind of that you know mindset, maybe a little old school mindset of, of a company of this path down AI, what are some of those questions that you're getting you know, within your organization of the ethical considerations of, of AI? So we have a whole team that basically just monitors that kind of information. And so, um, as I was talking about earlier, our suggestive selling tool, which, you know, we, it was one of our first models that we put into Data Robot. We just threw everything at it. And when it came back, they were like, can't have that, can't have that, can't have that, can't have that. And we, I mean, we were so young and new, we kind of were like, let's just go for it. And we kind of were, our, the, our, the reins were held back a little bit. Right. And so we've now really focused on what is important? If it's not that, then maybe it's something else. Fair. Right. And, and I, I'm guessing probably looking at now, you welcome that oh, governance, for sure. right? We, yeah. we for sure do. And uh, sometimes we don't like what we hear always. Right. Um, because nobody likes to be told no. Um, but it's going to help us in the long run. Fair. And I think if I can add to that too, I mean, you know, in, in my past life, that I... I worked for a research organization. I was trained in economics, and there was always this like piece of the model that you couldn't account for, right? And it was like motivation, and it was your inherent bias. And so I think that's like a really important consideration, also, that we are inherently biased, and if we don't acknowledge that, we can't do anything about it. And so, like by way of development, right, and training the models, and there's bias in the data. If we don't acknowledge that, we can't handle that. The models themselves are biased, right? And so, like again, I just think that this is—it's so good that we're having that discussion, right? Because then we can do something about it. We can make these models more fair. We can make the the AI uh, more equitable. Um, and if we didn't, then just inherently we would be perpetuating that um, that bias. That's fair. Jess, come to you on this because obviously, from an AI platform standpoint, like to you know the Sarah's point of like we just we want to go just do it, we want to do it all. Like obviously, that's you know we want to see how far we can push this thing. But what are some of the considerations ethically that you've seen within Data Robot over your time there, as and going into the building of the platform itself? Yeah, I really like the points that both of you have made. There, we've spend all of our time listening to customers, taking in that feedback, trying to build in solutions to some of these, like we have compliance documentation that it automatically gets generated. And if you have a MRM team, a model risk management team, that can be something that is already pre-baked for you. And that's an easy way to interact with that risk management team. Um, with the bias, that's something that we have thought about for years at Data Robot, ways to measure that, because data is only as good as the decisions that preceded it. So there are very easy ways to make poor decisions from the correct framework 
but because the underlying assumptions just there is there was an issue there. So detecting that bias and mitigating that bias, like these are all tools that we built into the platform to help speed along that process. And if not, if nothing else, at least to raise a flag that there may be something that you need to be aware of. If there's nothing that you can change about the end result, at least be aware that this is a concern and may grow over time. Um, we do have a team at Data Robot that is fully invested in how can we be ethical, ensuring that they're up to date on latest standards. Even like in EMEA, obviously there is there are many considerations there that need to be made that are just as important for the modeling process as the data that goes into it. Yeah. Jason, I'm, I'm, I'm curious from your interactions with customers, particularly on the, the consulting side, you know, as you're looking at implementation, I guess the first question is, who is usually the one that brings up the ethical considerations? Is it you asking, you know, them, or is that something that they're coming to you with right off the bat? Well, to be honest, I mean, this is really, that's such a, um, it's a gray area. Right, and so like it's typically uh, like client led, right? So I don't I don't really know because a lot like you know we're obviously not going to do things. We have been put into some situations where we've actually walked away from business because we're like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Good luck. Gotcha. Uh, and, you know, so like we'll we'll bring it up then when right. we're walking away. But when we're actually like deploying things, so it does come from the business, and so it comes from typically very very senior folks in the business will will question things. And I think the 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 the, the most glaring use case to me is when you look at uh, in the marketing world in particular is this like AI based customer lifecycle marketing. There's a point here when we get so much data on, the, on folks that the marketing efforts move beyond influence and into like, you know, coercion, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to have people doing things that are like so far departed from their best interest because you can, because this stuff is really friggin' powerful. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, but where is that line? Right, like it's we're at we're at a stage where it's like like it, it needs to be discussed. Right. Do you think it's how? I guess how much of that then? How 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 much is the user kind of responsible there? Like or, you know, or as opposed to the businesses that are are are, are pushing it out there, right? Because they'll it just say we're just advertising, right? We're just advertising. And yeah, but it's but we're at a stage where uh, no. Right, so right. like, yeah, it's, it's subjective and it has to be like, that's where the human element's gonna come back again, right? Yes, mechanically, you're doing this, and mechanically, yes, we all have free choice, however, like, no, right? So like, that's where you just, it's a, um, it's a shared responsibility too, I think. It's, it's the, the tools, the consultants, the clients, right. everybody in between. Right, really interesting. So, it, and, and you know, Right in line with that, of like consideration of of the power of this technology, right? We're in this world now of, of generative. Um, I think that we're obviously still sorting through the noise of generative. I think, right? We we obviously, I, I know, I've got a, a, a Chat GPT on on my phone that I've leveraged maybe to print out some questions for this panel, maybe. Um, and we're seeing it utilized in sort of what I would refer to as kind of these front end things, meaning like within sort of business process, like a lot of sort of the front end stuff, like, you know, generating of questions for a panel or generating slides, you know, all this sort of things that you can do. Where we maybe haven't seen yet so much like the output or business results that the generative, that the, the power of generative AI can drive. How, how are you, Selma and, and, and Carter's thinking about that now? Do you, what opportunities do you see with, with generative as you look into the future? So I will say that I have kind of two frames of mind here. The first one being, right, like we, I, I will admit, are on this hype cycle, we'll tr we're trying to figure out how can we leverage it, how can we be early adopters, right? And I think that the ways that are prevailing have been kind of people processes, right? So how do we augment these processes? How do we make people more efficient at the jobs that they're doing? Um, and then how does that increase efficacy, right? So how do how do they do their jobs better with this um, with generative AI? I would say that for me, that when I think about like big picture, I want to use this as an opportunity to also kind of inform our strategic roadmap, right? Like our strategies around AI and ML. So 
you know, the gen AI is just a piece of it, right? And so like, how do we approach this? How do we look forward in the next five years to say like, everything's gonna change, right? Like I can't, I can't tell you what this is gonna look like in the next five years, but I know that whatever the change is, this is how I'm going to approach it. Like these are the values that I have. These are my principles around um, decision analytics and data science. Then the other piece of it too is that I think that there's this huge unlock and the, to your point of like, when we look beyond people processes, right, and the way that people work, is like, how does this like inherently change the way that we like live, right? So the way that we shop, like, when I think about our business, we care deeply about our products, our customers, right, our sales, and so like, how can I use generative AI to change the way that people shop, right, so that they're shopping better, so that they're shopping more, um, so that like that they're buying more of our products, and I think that that's gonna be a huge unlock, but I just don't think that we're, we're quite there yet. Sarah. Sarah, for you, how do you see generative, not only within your organization, but within your industry itself, right? The insurance industry, what do you see, you know, if you, if you had to crystal ball that a year or two out of like how generative AI gets applied within Aflac and, 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 and within your space? So I think a lot, has, as she said, has to do with the people. The, the people processing the claims, the people taking the calls, how do we take generative AI to the next level that way? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure your bill is applied correctly to the right policy that way through AI? Right. That's the way I feel like that the insurance industry is going to go. Fair, and I, think it, and I think it can apply to any number of industries, right? I mean, but beyond retail and, and you know health insurance, but even if we think about manufacturing and, supply chain and all of these sort of things. There's there's a lot of opportunity there because there's a human element to all of those things. Just from a from a data robot standpoint, obviously now we too are, are trying to ride this hype train, right? We're and we're scrambling to get, you know, generative AI capabilities within the platform because it's being called for. I mean, I've only been with the company for seven months and I know that we've completely changed our messaging and and everything, you know, uh, in the time that I've been there around you know generative AI. So I, you know when you look at like the, what we have today, right, and the capabilities, but I know that you also are passionate about, it's not just gen AI in a vacuum, right? It has that predictive sort of legacy AI, if you will, element to it as well. And, and I, I know that this is something that you're passionate about, so take it away with that. <laughs> I yeah. mean, just to set the context, um, the, is generative AI right now is like absolute wild, wild west. E every day, it's changing entirely over again and for me personally this is a very fun time in my life because it really scratches that startup itch i love going through and be like this is a brand new problem let's let's we're diving into this together but so it's interesting to you know to your hype cycle uh comment i'm not fully sure that for machine learning that we're fully out of that hype cycle either and this is we're just jumping straight in with generative ai so from the you know from the data robot platform uh, our viewpoint is we do have an opinion, but it is changing day by day. So the goal is be as flexible as we can, be as interoperable as we can, be as open to how can we fit all these very rapidly changing solutions into a pipeline that makes sense. It's not just about experimenting. It's not just about building a use case, but how can we ensure that there is still real value at the end of the day? How can we make sure that we're still monitoring, that we're still governing the output of what comes mm -hmm. out, whatever it may be. Um, for chat applications, there is a very clear human in the loop. For some of that intersection that you just mentioned of where we have a combination of both generative and predictive, they're layered together. The intersection there is, I think, where we're really going to find value, mm. but that requires extra work from stakeholders, that requires a lot of extra work from the pipeline. Governance of that is going to be a whole layer um, that, that we're all kind of just kind of discovering together, but um, flexibility is the most important part in this right now. Don't get locked into a single ecosystem that says, we have this vector database, we have this tool, these are what you're going to use. It changes every single day. Right. So Jason, and, and I think we're about five minutes or so left uh, to, to finish this up. I think we're in good shape there. But um, how, how often are you hearing, hey, I hear I need generative AI from your customers, right? And then it's like, 
give me some of that generative AI. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, how, how are you addressing that at the market? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, constantly, right? Like right. everybody, but it's also, it's that mix I was talking about earlier where some are like, I need a generative AI, right? And it's like, well, let's talk about this, right? right? Yeah. So really about, it's about finding those, those use cases, right? And like helping folks really understand like how it can be, how it can be working. What we're seeing now though, is this move to a, I don't need chat GPT because I don't want everything out there public. I need a private, I need my own LLM, I need to train in my own personal data. And so we are actually having success uh, with that. I think that's the, that's the real, when we get into highly you know, personalized, right? I mean, from a business perspective, customized, right? Proprietary right. applications of it that are trained on your proprietary data that is not out there in the public. Like, that's what we're seeing. We just, I think we deployed like our first one of those somewhat recently. Uh, and I think that's where we're seeing the biggest um, real value. I will say when I look at the, this world, like it is, there, there are real practical applications that are in play right now. And I see as a business owner, uh, like my legal bills are going down because like, holy cow, like if I were an attorney, like a contract attorney, I would be scared shitless because right. like you are no longer needed and no business owner likes you. So <laughs> it, like things like that are like, I, I don't know, but that, that's fun. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, guys, I, I think this one, it's the type of conversation that will obviously continue on, you know, in, in the halls here as we go forward and the conferences. I think, first off, thank you to the panel for, for jumping up here today, particularly Selma and Sarah for, for joining us today. Jason and Jess, you guys didn't have much of a choice, but thanks for, you know, <laughs> making it on time. Uh, Jason particularly. No, uh, but thank you all so much for coming again. For, my name is Colby Miller. I'm with Data Robot. If you want to continue this conversation with any of our panelists, we will be at our booth, which is directly out that door and next to the candy station for who else needs that uh, afternoon sugar jolt. But we appreciate your guys' time very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.